One of the things that makes us fundamentally human is that we have this curiosity about our own biology, about kind of what accounts for our existence on Earth. You can place any human, you know, whether they're you know, a baby or they're, you know, 90 years old and, and in a room and, and they'll find something to be curious about in that room. And then leveraging that understanding to create technology that actually improves our condition. My work focuses on, on people who have had uh, arm amputations. I want to be able to, to grant them back all of the independence and motion and control of, uh, of our prosthesis that they would have had with an intact limb. I'm working on building soft, flexible probes for uh, interfacing with the brain and, and studying brain activity. I'm working on this really beautiful molecular syringe uh, called the contractile injection system. So we specifically work on prosthetic limbs, uh, exoskeletons. So this is a bundle of some of our fiber. You know, even though it looks a little gross on the outside, it's actually quite a beautiful system. Uh, this is the Luke arm. Uh, the Luke arm is the, the hardware device that we work on. It's one of the most uh, advanced robotic upper extremity prostheses. So we were able to successfully reprogram this, this uh, contractile injection system uh, to target human cells and deliver therapeutic payloads specifically into human cells. So I think what defines us as human is that we have uh, complex thoughts and, and memories and problem solving skills, but we're also, we have emotions and creativity. The way humans do it is that they cre they're creative, right? They make art, they can make music. I grew up a musician, so I've been studying music for a long time and thinking about music and what makes music so memorable. Why is it that, you know, you hear a song and it brings you back to a time of like, you know, car rides with friends or, you know, losses of loved ones, that sort of thing. And somehow that is all arising out of this complex symphony of activity within billions of neurons inside your brain. How does the brain do all of this rich computation that we're talking about on such a limited energy and space budget? I'm interested in how do uh, your life experiences affect our memory and perception and vice versa? How does uh, your perception affect your memory? All of this you know, mechanistic stuff, it ultimately supports these beings that are full of light and, and poetry and, and music. Before I came to MIT, I was actually a law student. As I was in law school, it turned out that a lot of the more interesting questions seemed to hinge on an understanding of the human mind. I think what sets us apart as humans is our social and moral mind, which basically tells us how to treat others and how to behave in a social world. There's this age-old question that's, that's driven um, legal academics and lawyers for a long time, which is how do judges make decisions? I want to know when things go wrong, how do we intervene to influence and change others' behavior? And sometimes we fail to do so, and I want to know why and how to fix it. I do know people who are afflicted by addiction. I think most people probably do. Maybe they're not aware of it. When people are in pain, uh, pain takes over everything. One question we're asking is how the brain changes during the cycle of addiction. How does stress impact our brain function? We don't really know uh, exactly why uh, some people experience frontal limb pain, uh, but we have some idea. And so I'm really thinking about, you know, the hows and the whys and like the what context, you know, makes someone either rise to the occasion of stress or really crumble. Addiction kind of starts to, to make us question, you know, what is free will versus what is not. You know, we can't eliminate stress from our lives, but what we can change is how we perceive that stress and our, how we perceive our abilities to take on that stressor. Try to innovate and try to discover and try to, to invent new things that makes us overcome our physical and cognitive limitations. Language is exciting because it's a window into the mind. It's a window into thought. I'm a language researcher, so I have to say that what makes us special is language. I think it's you know a deep need to feel other minds and to communicate with them. Communicating your ideas and uh, uh, communicating your emotions, your folks. And not just communicate, but be understood. Have them really hear you. 
around 30% of autistic children is non-verbal or minimally verbal. The, the question I'm trying to, to answer is uh, how can we create a technology that's able to translate these sounds uh, into emotions uh, or like uh, more understandable concepts. Language is really specialized and separate from other kinds of cognitive functions. So now we can take this insight and apply it in the area of artificial intelligence. I think being human-like is something any computational system, given the appropriate resources, could achieve. Specifically, we now see these new models, these large language models that are trained on huge amounts of text. And we want to know what it is that they are good at versus bad at. Are these models models of language or models of thought? It's less a question of, of can we achieve it? It's more of a question of like, you know, is that something that we should try and do? Because I, I definitely think it's possible. It's exciting to see that our work on human cognition now has implications for AI, but to me personally, the goal is still to understand the human mind. <laughs>